start, I'd like to introduce uh, Nate Bush. He is a CPA. He's my CPA. He works with uh, quite a few left fielders, and he is a, a real estate investor himself, which which I really like. He has done, um, I don't know how many tribes from TribeVest tax returns he's done, but he does those really well, really affordable, and really quickly. So we're thankful for Nate. And today, he has offered to talk to us about cost segregation, which is um, super important and very interesting given the changes in the tax code. So Nate, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to turn my camera off so we can focus on you. And we'll go for as long as you want, Nate. And at the end, uh, we'll have questions. And I'll, I usually just read those off at the end um, from, the, uh, from the comments for you. So if that sounds good to you, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. For sure. Thank you, Jim. And, and thank you for having me. Um, can you see my uh, shared screen? Okay, good. You're muted, by the way, Jim. Um, yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I uh, uh, I generally like uh, like to do these sorts of presentations for very selfish reasons. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, when I get a uh, when I get a lot of the same questions over and over and over and over, um, it really motivates me to just kind of put this into a presentation format where you know it allows a lot of folks just to be able to refer to it. And and cost segregation is a very popular issue. Um, it's something that's actually been around for, oh, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's as if it's really just come alive in the past five. Um, you know, I've worked with cost segregation for about, I don't know, all but three years of my being a CPA. So I, I kind of got into it and understood it about 12 years ago. Um, it is a, uh, it, it's a concept that hasn't always been popular just because of the cost of the process and it's it's really excluded a lot of normal small business folks away from enjoying the benefits um you know when you think of very large real estate investors you know obviously the name donald trump's going to come up you know trump has been using this technique uh ever since it's first existed um you know when there was a uh, you know i i understand his tax returns just came out uh you know over the past uh, 10 years or, or what have you. Um, but when there was first talk of him having a tax return that had this massive loss that was released by the Wall Street Journal or what have you about uh, six or seven years ago, um, that loss that was referenced on there, you know, everybody likes to point at him being a bad businessman and, you know, running casinos into the ground and a tax cheat and this and that. In reality, that large loss was uh, derived from cost segregation. And this is a legitimate technique, and it's a technique that basically allows you to deduct a very, very large portion of the purchase price plus the improvements of a building right off the bat, usually in the year of purchase. You, you can do it in years following the purchase, but it becomes much more complex and costly to do that. So you get, usually get your biggest bang for your buck using this te technique in the very first year. So kind of get into this a bit. What is a cost segregation? Uh, it's a study that's done uh, by a qualified engineer. It's sort of like a structural appraisal. Um, you know, they walk through the building, they will take notes, they'll take some pictures, they'll do a study, um, and they really, really write up a report that identifies short-lived assets that exist within a real estate property. Um, what the tax courts and code say is that when you buy a piece of property, it's not all property. Uh, there's little stuff in that that exists. And uh, those little things, uh, the tax code says, have has shorter lifespans. And the shorter lifespan something has, the quicker you can depreciate it, write it off. On the theory that since it lasts less long, you should be able to write it off quicker. Um, so what the cost segregation does is it is a much more precise vehicle to identify those short life assets. It is supposed to be a scientific type study and it's supposed to be highly credible and that's why it's normally done by a qualified engineer um, in the tax code the irs permits two types of depreciation if you've ever heard uh 27 and a half years or 30 39 and a half years of depreciation taken on something that refers to the real estate so you know think of it this way you know when i rehab homes uh think of the full gut job right you buy something and you've heard the term taking it down to the studs. Uh, the stuff that you put, you know, behind the walls, up against the studs, we're talking about mechanicals, 
you know, we're talking about any two by fours, any beams, any structure, anything that supports the home and what I call the big white box inside. And anybody that's in heavy rehab understands what the big white box is. It's basically the drywall that's been sanded, scraped, you know, trimmed up a bit. And we start putting stuff on that. The stuff that you put on that, for the most part, is considered non-real estate additions. Um, we're talking paint, we're talking trim, we're talking lighting fixtures, cabinets, countertops, appliances, flooring. Um, for the most part, there's exceptions to those things, but for the most part, all of those add-ons to the big white box on the inside are actually considered non-real estate depreciable property. And because they're non-real estate depreciable property, you have an argument to depreciate these things faster than your typical 27 or 39 uh, year li uh, lives. And the faster you can depreciate something, the more depreciation expense you get. Um, so that's really the main benefit here. And cost segregation is what extracts. It, it extracts those values to a maximum level. And the output of that is called bonus depreciation. Under the current tax law, bonus depreciation is accelerated, really fast super depreciation that uh, five, 15, and 20 year property are eligible for. And as we go on in this, I'll get more specific about what exactly five, 15, and 20 year property is. But just understand, you know, uh, every home has real estate, non real estate, and the non real estate stuff is extracted through cost segregation, which allows you to take this bonus depreciation. Very, very, very large deductions that exist. So, what is bonus depreciation? Um, so again, only short lived assets qualify. You can't take bonus depreciation on 27 year property or 39. So again, think the actual structure and the big white box that doesn't qualify for this, um, but five year property does. Again, examples, appliances, cabinets, countertops, vinyl flooring, carpet, lighting fixtures, seven year property can be equipment. Um, you know, think of like HVAC machinery. Again, it can't be behind the walls. So you can't be deducting duct work. You can't be deducting uh, you know, any wiring, anything behind, um, that's all part of the structure, but it's the stuff on the outside that generally qualifies. 15-year uh, property, landscaping, pavement, decking, fencing, um, you know, anything that's outside that, you know, as one person put it once that stuck with me, anything that's outside that wasn't put, put there by God is basically 15-year property on the outside. Um, so again, uh, any land improvements, those qualify. Again, all three of these categories qualify for bonus depreciation. So what bonus depreciation is, is it basically says, okay, once you identify those costs that fall into these buckets, in 2022, you'll see down here at the bottom, in 2022, 100% of those costs are immediately deducted, okay? So let's say you buy a house for $200,000 and this cost seg report identifies 40,000 of that as belonging to five, seven, and 15 year property. In 2022, you would be able to take a $40,000 deduction. In 2023, you would be able to take a $32,000 deduction, all right? Because now the rules are changing. In 2023, you get to write off 80% of the cost of these short-lived assets. And you'll see that it really starts to phase out over the next three years until 2026, where it's completely gone, all right? Now, again, that's bonus depreciation that's gone. Um, th there's a, there is a common misperception here that cost segregations go away, all right? These cost segs are leaving us. They're, they're getting phased out. Again, that's not true, all right? Uh, cost segregations are the vehicle that extract uh, five, seven, and 15-year values, right? Bonus depreciation, it's what's going away, okay? So if we live in a world where there's no bonus depreciation, do cost segs do anything for us? Well, technically they do because they can still extract uh, values for five, seven, and 15 year property, which means, you know, again, if we go back to this example of a $200,000 home and $40,000 has been identified for short lived assets, and let's say of that 40, 20,000 of that specifically belongs to five year. What that means is that 20,000 in particular can be depreciated over five years. So it's still on an accelerated schedule, much faster than 27 years, all right, which applies to real estate in general. The cost segregation can still get you a benefit. Is it as awesome and accelerated as bonus depreciation? No, but it still allows you to depreciate things faster. So if anybody tells you cost segs are going away, technically that's not correct. Cost segs have always been here. 
the value of cost segs is getting diluted. There still is value, but it's nothing like it is right now. Um, if anybody has any questions so far, I, I, you know, I'm happy to take them before I continue. Okay, I'll continue on. So once we get these things, how do we use them? All right, well, on a previous uh, webinar podcast, uh, Zoom meeting, I talked about buckets of losses. We talked about passive buckets and portfolio buckets and active buckets. And this is kind of us really drilling down into, into the passive and active buckets here and how they pertain to rental real estate. So, you know, many of you are, uh, many of you are full-time employees that really don't have time to screw around with management of real estate, but you got some money that you're investing in these tribes and syndications and REITs. You don't do any management whatsoever. Um, you're just putting your money into these things, hoping for a good return. You fall into this first category of just truly passive participation. All right. So again, you, you are really nothing more than a pure financial investor that, you know, is interested in, in putting your money into real estate. You fall into this category. And what that means is any losses that we generate from this will only offset future gains from rental real estate. So, you know, if in year one, you know, your, your tribe generates a huge loss, you're just going to carry it forward. And let's say in year two, three, four, the tribe starts generating some profit. That profit you won't pay tax on because you have this big first year loss that can then offset it. So, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not as, you know, beneficial. Some of these other buckets in terms of that first year benefit, there is a benefit, you know, you could create a big loss that can offset future gains if you're this passive investor. The second category, active participation. So imagine you've got a handful of rental properties or real estate investments where you're doing more than just being a tribe member. Now you're actually participating in management. All right. So there's no property manager. You're in there. You've got three or four rental properties. You're answering tenant calls. You, you, you still have a full-time job, but you know, you're still kind of doing this on the side. That, this probably accounts for you know, a large majority of all real estate investors in the country. Um, so, you know, again, this, uh, uh, you know, th this still allows you uh, to deduct some loss each and every year. Um, it's a $25,000 loss allowance if your adjusted gross income is less than $100,000. Pardon me just for five seconds. I need to go shut his door open. So the second uh, bucket of active participation, again, the, your, your typical landlord that self-manages, um, it's a $25,000 loss allowance if you adjust the gro gross income is less than $100,000. Um, if your income is above $150,000, you get no loss allowance whatsoever, even though you participate more than this category one of, of tribe member passive participation. If you make over $150,000, the losses are basically treated the same as if you were just a passive tribe member. So that's something you really want to consider if you're going to get into residential real estate is those losses will, again, only offset future gains from real estate, whether it's capital gain or cash flow. So, you know, again, very important to understand that. And if your income is between 100000 to 150, there's a proportional phase out of that $25,000 allowance. So for every dollar your income is above 100, that 25000 gets reduced by 50 cents. So you can see why when you get to 150, you have zero left. And then we get into this third category called real estate professional. If you are a full-time dude in real estate, and this is really all you do, and you know you don't necessarily need to be a full-time landlord, you just need to be a full-time real estate entrepreneur. So you could be a real estate broker, you could be a realtor, um, you could be a contractor, you could be you know basically anything within the real estate profession. Again, there's exceptions to all this, but in general, you could be a full-time real estate person, not necessarily a landlord, and you qualify for this third bucket. And the three requirements, one, you have to have 750 total hours of real estate something. Again, doesn't necessarily have to be property management. It can be, you know, any of those categories, realtor, broker, contractor, you know, what have you. 
Um, and then of the 750 hours, 500 of that must be property management. Um, so you have to be managing your own properties. Um, and then the third requirement, there can't be any other non-real estate job that takes more time. So, you know, if you've got a 40 hour a week, uh, normal day job and, you know, you devote another 15 hours a week towards your real estate, you're going to meet that 750 hour test. You're probably going to meet that property management test, but you fail the third test, which says if you have a non-real estate W-2 that takes more time, you're not a real estate professional. So it's very important to understand that third requirement. That that's one that a lot of folks miss when they talk to me for the first time and think they qualify as an REP. Um, if you do qualify as an REP, unlimited use of loss. You completely avoid the passive loss rules whatsoever. You know, do not you know uh, do not stop and go. You go right to you know full deduction as if these losses are active because the tax code says you are completely full time active. Treat it like any losses from uh, any normal business. And cost segregations normally pair best with REPs. If you think about what a cost seg is, it's a huge first year deduction for buying a property and putting it into service. And real estate professionals are allowed a full big first year deduction. And um, you know it, it, it's kind of cool going out and shopping for a property and getting a huge tax write-off and huge tax benefit for buying that property. A lot of my real estate professional clients almost feel like the government is subsidizing their down payment every single time they buy a property in the first year. So, you know, again, it's a really, really neat strategy when you couple the cost segregation concept with being a real estate professional. Here's another really cool twist to this. Let's say you're, you're, real, you're a real estate professional and you're a tribe member, all right? Real estate professionals really do have to, have to make an election on the return to treat all rental activities as one activity. Well, when you do that, you're not just treating the rental activities that you are self-managing, you're treating all rental activities. And that includes rental losses that you're getting from your tribes, all right? So when you get this big K-1 showing a big loss from a rental activity, which you really have no management participation, because you manage so many other things and you're so involved in real estate elsewhere and you make an election, losses from those tribes, those syndications are grouped into your normal rental losses and it's all deductible. So you can still use this cost segregation technique if the tribes or the, or the REITs or the syndications that are doing cost segs themselves, you can use that just like it's your own cost seg for your own property that you're self-managing. So, you know, that's just a really neat twist to this and a really neat loophole if you are a real estate professional. Again, if you're not, then you fall into the other two categories and your losses from cost seg or rental real estate in general they're going to be used in future periods. And if anybody has any questions, you are more than welcome to interrupt me. This is for you, not necessarily me. So again, feel free to interrupt at yeah, any point. Nate, Nate, I have a few here in, from the comments. Um, is there a limitation on how long you have held a property before you can do a cost seg? For example, if I bought a property four years ago, can I still do one for 2023? So there, there's a technical answer and a practical answer. The technical answer is there's no limit whatsoever. You can do a cost seg. It, it, it doesn't matter. You can do a cost seg at any point. All right. But the way that the tax code works is they say, if you do a cost segregation in year or whatever, we'll say four of owning the property and the cost segregation extracts a bunch of this accelerated depreciation and short lived assets. Um, the technical way of getting all that, you don't go back and do an amendment for all these years it was missed. You file something called a change of accounting method. And what it does is it calculates the depreciation that you did take versus what you should have taken had you gotten a cost seg all along. And you get to take a deduction for the difference. It's a very, very complex measure. Um, and what you'll find is there's a cost benefit for always doing these things. And the longer you go, the more expensive it is to do the study and actually apply it, and the less depreciation you're actually getting that's accelerated. Because again, the longer you're, you're holding the property, the more you're depreciating. So again, that big bump that you get in year whatever really dilutes quickly the longer you hold it, and the cost of implementing it just really goes up. My cost for my clients of doing a cost in year one 
not bad. It's usually, you know, about $250, $300, you know, per property. Um, if you were to come to me in year four and want me to do it, it's probably going to be about a thousand. That's how more complex the forms are and the processes to apply for what's called a change of accounting method. So technical answer, sure, you can do it year 30 if you want. The practical answer, probably after year two or three, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Again, there's always exceptions. And Nate, just to follow up, the the cost you're talking about is not if you're getting a um you're getting a cost seg on a K one, right? If you, it, that's just flowing through, that's the cost is if you actually own the property yourself and did a cost seg and had you do the paperwork for it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, if you get a K one from a tribe that has a big loss on it, all that work's already been done. That work was done by an engineer that the tribe hired, and it was done by the accountant that did the tribe's return. Okay. Um, and then another question, how does the recapture work on these accelerated depreciated amounts? Yeah, when you sell the property or the tribe sells the property or, or what have you, any depreciation that's been taken is recouped as taxable. And it's recouped at an ordinary tax rate, not capital gains. So for instance, you buy a million dollar property, you get a big first year cost seg deduction of 200,000. Over the next couple of years, you depreciate another 100,000 of it. And then in year whatever, 10, you sell it for 1.5. In that example, you would have a $500,000 capital gain, which is again, what you sold it for minus what you originally bought it for. And then, and that would be taxed at capital gains brackets, zero to 20%, depending on what your other income looks like. And then the depreciation recapture uh, is going to be 300,000, all right? The cost seg depreciation of 200 plus the other 100,000 of normal depreciation that you've taken. And that entire 300,000 gets recaptured at a rate that's higher than uh, capital gains, normally 25%. Um, okay. So yeah, it, it's later in the, you know, a couple of slides from now, we'll get into it, but you know, I refer to it as what goes up must come down. Depreciation is not a permanent deduction, all right? It's a temporary deduction. It's a deduction that you're borrowing from the government and you have to pay that back without interest, but you do have to pay that back whenever you sell. There's one huge exception to that. It's if you die, if you die, nobody pays that back. That loan is forgiven and you pass the property off to your, your beneficiaries and they're not responsible for paying that back. That's the only exception to that rule. Okay, a few more questions are coming up. Um, is it ever possible to become a real estate professional uh, if you're an LP investor or would GP activities count as active participation? So I think that's two questions. So could, could an LP investor be a, a, an REP? Um, if the question is asking, if all I'm doing is being a limited partner, and let's yes. say I'm an LP and a handful of these things, is it possible for me to be an REP? I'm sure it's possible but the way that these, these organizations are, are structured, LPs are not meant to be part of actual property management. That's why they hire property managers out. So I would assume you're going to have a very, very steep uphill climb convincing the IRS that you're participating in management if you're an LP. You're basically telling the IRS that, you know, the, the, the tribe is structured one way, but in practice, we're not following that at all. I might be an LP, but I'm really a GP. I'm participating in all this management. I'm actually doing a lot of this property management, even though, you know, I'm a limited partner on paper. So again, is it possible? Sure. You know, is it realistic? Probably not, unless you're violating the original structure of the organization to begin with. LPs are not meant to participate. And then, so I guess GPs, if you, if you had enough GP action or if you're a GP on enough things, then that would count as active participation. So it, it depends because I do a lot of tribes. I'll do some tribes where there's a GP and the tribe itself does not own property. It just owns a bunch of other tribes. All right. So it's like an umbrella tribe. So yeah. if you're a GP of an umbrella tribe, does that count? I don't think so because managing paperwork that you're receiving for other partnerships that that tribe is an LP in, managing LP investments is still doesn't get you there. You have to manage property. Okay, so if you're a GP of the actual asset, that would qualify, but not if you're just managing a, a, a tribe that's investing in stuff. 
Yeah. So think of acquisition managers or acquisition partners or asset manager partners, those guys that are managing the manager, so to speak, I, I think you can get there. Okay. Um, you still got to meet the hour tests and you have to clearly show that you are an active participant in property management duties. Okay. Um, I don't know if we're getting ahead of things here, but we'll keep going with questions since we're, we're on it now. But if, if uh, someone does land investing, is that an issue with being an REP because it doesn't have property management with tenants? Um, if by land invest, investing, we just mean developing or wholesaling or flipping land, it, it, it seems like that's the context. Mm -hmm. um, that'll qualify you for the first bucket. That's the 750 hours because that's, you know, land development is considered a general free for all real estate participation. All right. So you'll pass test one with those hours, 750 hours, but you're still going to have to show some property management time and property management uh, really means managing rental real estate of some sort, whether it's commercial, whether it's, you know, rental or if it's land rent. I mean, if you're renting the land out and you're having to, help, you know, coordinate vendors to hook up utilities or, you know, manage land improvements or things like that. That's how you satisfy that bucket number two of property management time. So, you know, again, you can get there, but, you know, you still got to uh, satisfy that second bucket of you're going to have to be a landlord somehow, some way. Okay. Um, is it too late to do a cost seg on a property purchased in 2022 and apply it to 2022? Yeah, um, probably. Um, there is a, uh, uh, there's one exception where you can go back and do an amendment and basically petition the IRS and ask them for bonus depreciation that wasn't taken. But here's the tricky thing with bonus depreciation. Um, if you want it for that year, technically you're supposed to declare it and get it before the extended deadline of the return. And once you pass, you can't technically go back and get an amendment for that, but there's an exception to that. So the answer to that is maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, but you can for sure, for sure get the cost seg in 2023 through what's called a change of accounting method. You can absolutely do that. And the cost of doing that year two shouldn't, if your accountant knows what they're doing and, and they have your best interest in mind, the cost of an accountant doing that year two shouldn't be that much more than the cost of doing it in year one. Okay. Um, how does this apply to a W-2 employee that has an Airbnb that meets the requirements as an active investment? Can you still do a cost seg to help on overall income? So this is a reference to the Airbnb short-term rental loophole. Okay. Um, there is one exception to all of this. And if you own a short-term rental, and a short-term rental is defined by uh, the IRS, Congress, as a, uh, um, a rental property where the average stay is seven days or less, which probably is the vast majority of Airbnbs or VRBOs. Um, if you meet that criteria, and this is a true Airbnb, and you manage it, you can't be a co-host, all right? You have to manage this. You can't put the bookings and the tenant management and everything onto somebody else and just sit back and collect your fee. If you satisfy those two tests, um, you qualify for the short-term rental uh, loophole, which says you only have to meet the 100-hour test. There's a 100-hour test for managing a property. And if you're doing Airbnbs the right way, a lot of times all you need is one to meet that test. That's two hours a week. Um, so yes, that does qualify. You could get a cost segregation on that Airbnb and you don't have to meet the arduous 750-hour test. You don't have to meet the 500-hour test. And, and mo most importantly, you don't have to meet the, I'm, do I'm devoting more time to real estate than any other activity test. You forego all of those. And yes, you only have the 100-hour test. Okay. A couple more here. Um, on the K-1, is regular depreciation reported on a different line than accelerated depreciation? No. Okay. That was an easy one. Um, which state does it not make sense to do bonus depreciation and cost segs, uh, i.e. New York state residents? 
I'm not sure I understand exactly what they're asking, but maybe you do. Or and in New York State investment. Right. So this is a horror story that I'll share with you. Um, I, I have a uh, um, I have a client who uh, shared with me their tax returns, and uh, they were working with another accountant, and they were a resident of New York. They invested in a tribe in New York, uh, and that tribe owned property in New York. And New York has a funny requirement where it says that you have to add back 80% of any cost segregation depreciation that you've taken in a particular year, okay? And when we think of taken, uh, hold on a second here. When we, when we think of taken, uh, we think of you deducting it on your federal return, getting to enjoy the benefit and having the state basically say, okay, the feds might have let you do it, but we're going to have you take it at a slower pace. And if that were the case, it's like, okay, I, I, a lot of us, we can live with that. All right. State, you have your own rules. Fine. You know, we'll take our depreciation over, you know, five years instead of all at once. We can deal with that. Well, in this example, New York has this trap rule that says, uh, hey, we don't care if you actually got it at the federal level or not. Even if you took a million dollars of bonus depreciation and it's included in that passive bucket that's carrying forward, we're still going to have you add it 80% back for state purposes. So this client got a million dollar cost seg deduction, got no federal benefit from it whatsoever because he's that passive uh, participant. So it just carries forward. But New York had him add back $800,000 of income as taxable and have him pay tax on that, even though it didn't help him at all at the IRS level. So th there are really, really awful traps, especially in these Northeastern states that are really hungry for tax revenue. Um, it's impossible for me to go through all the scenarios, all the states. I would just say, make sure that you're working with an accountant that understands how these rules apply across different states. Um, but, you know, if, if, we, if our clients find themselves in a situation where uh, they run into those sorts of traps, you know, we walk them through it and we caution them through it. Fortunately, it doesn't happen often. This is a this is a horror story, but it's you know kind of a a freak accident sort of thing that a client went through once. Unfortunately, it didn't happen under our watch. But you know, we advise all of our clients. Um, you know, anytime they're doing new purchases or sales or any of this, they're always welcome to reach out to us and and check with us. But yeah, those things are out there and those, those, those landmines are out there and it's important to walk around them. Excellent. That's it for the questions uh, for now. I'm sure we'll have more as we, uh, as we go through it. So thank you. Right. So now let's say you've, you've admitted to yourself, you're a passive investor. You know, I'm not going to be able to be a, an REP. I, I can't meet any of these other, other requirements. So how can I use this? How can this still benefit me? All right. So we already walked through here uh, some of the bullet points for passive participation. Again, no management. You're just purely a tribe guy. Um, you know, losses of only offset future gains. You know, in a previous podcast, you know, I, I had coined the term lazy 1031 exchange, and we kind of walked you through this. Again, just to kind of, uh, you know, sum that up and what that meant. Every, most everybody knows what, the, what a 1031 is. You have a property that has a lot of gain. You sell it. You can roll it into a next property under certain time constraints, all right? Well, what happens if you can't find the right property, you need more time, you run out of time, you just can't do the 1031, you could, in theory, buy a property in an early part of the year, have a big gain, find another property later in the year, do a cost seg on that, and use that cost seg depreciation on property two to offset a lot of the capital gain on property one. And it kind of sort of gets you close to what a 1031 does. All right, which is why I call it a lazy 1031. So, you know, in this instance, remember, you know, even though you can't use your losses against active income like W-2 or a side business or any of this, even though you're passive, you can use losses from passive real estate to offset gains from passive real estate. So, you know, that is a thing. You know, we can also do this in the inverse as well. In this example down here, Let's say in year one, you buy a property and you use a cost segregation, knowing that it's just going to create this big loss that carries forward. Um, 
you can do that year one, create this big loss that carries forward. And let's say it's part of your plan that in the next year, you're going to sell another rental property you have. That gain that you have from property B in year two can offset the big loss from property A in year one that you didn't get to use. So these carry forwards are real and they, could, they can offset and they can create planning opportunities in the future. So if you're bummed out and you have a big loss from cost seg or tribes or whatever, and you can't use it, you may be able to use it someday. And if it's part of your long-term planning that you expect to have capital gains from cashing out or selling a portfolio, you know, this lazy 1031 works in reverse as well. Create a big carry forward loss, carry it forward, sell off some gains in the future, and it'll offset those losses. And then again, you know, I mentioned this before, you know, you still get simple sheltering of future cash flow. Year one, let's say your tribe generates a huge loss. Years two through five, let's say, you know, you get 10, 10 grand a year in cash flow. Those losses can shelter that cash flow. So, you know, you could find yourself getting a tax deferred type income stream that you're really not paying tax on. So, you know, again, there's some benefit there. Now, keep in mind, and these are good questions to ask your tribe, keep in mind, uh, you know, if this thing sells, you're going to have depreciation recapture passed through to you from the tribe as well. So recapture is not just a, you know, mom and pop landlord thing, it applies to anything that's getting cost segregation or depreciation in general. Some other special considerations. If you're using creative financing to acquire a deal, all right, subject twos, for example, which in my opinion, subject twos are gonna be huge over the next couple of years. Like when you look at what's going on with, with you know, jobs, you know, employers are cutting jobs, you know, Facebook just dropped 10, you know, 10,000 jobs, you know, Tesla's laying off a bunch of people, Twitter laid off a bunch of people. I mean, you're going to start seeing high tech jobs drop, you know, rapidly over the next couple of years, um, which means you're going to have people that can't afford their mortgages anymore. And, you know, these might be really great mortgages that were taken out during the great years. Think like, you know, three, 4% fixed rate mortgages on homes. Um, you could step in, be a hero to them, take over their mortgage subject to, turn it around, rent them out and enjoy a fixed three to 4% uh, interest rate on a home where you basically access free capital. You save, the, uh, you save the seller, so to speak. You save them from having their credit destroyed by having the property go to short sale or foreclosure. Everybody wins, the bank's thrilled. Bank's thrilled because they're getting their payment. They don't have to go through foreclosure either. So. If you use creative financing like subject twos, that also qualifies for cost segregation. All right, we tend to think that cost seg is only only is you know only is eligible for conventional all right purchases. Got to go through a bank. You got to put money down. You got to now it works for subject twos. It also uh, works with owner finance. You know land contracts, contract for deeds, deed and trusts. These are all the same thing. It's just owner finance type arrangements across different states that qualifies as well. Um, lease options, you know, th this could become a thing, you know, when people are trying to find creative financing, a lease option, again, you put down some money and, you know, you have the option to purchase the property later and you get to rent it out. You might turn around and rent it out to somebody else and keep a spread. Lease options generally don't qualify because those aren't considered a sale. It's an option to buy down the road, but it's not a technical sale. So again, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole because there's so many different ways to do creative financing. Just know that if creative financing is done the right way, those two also qualify for cost segregation. Depreciation recapture, somebody already asked about that. What goes up must go down. Talk about that. This is really, really, really important to think about with cost segregations. You guys need to be focused on what you're actually getting with a cost seg. You know, in my example of somebody that bought a million dollar property and took a $200,000 deduction, um, that $200,000, you know, deduction in a 30% bracket could be a $60,000 tax savings. All right. If you stop right there, all right, and you think of that example, most everybody will think, oh, well, that cost seg benefited me 60 grand, right? And in a way that's true. But when we think of depre depreciation recapture, in theory, you're probably going to pay that 60 grand back someday. So the 60,000 is not your benefit. It's what you do with the 60,000 that's your benefit. That 60,000 is an interest-free loan from the IRS. So if you're having to pay an accountant and an engineer a thousand bucks to do the analysis, do the work on the return to get a $60,000 tax benefit, 
you're really paying an origination fee of $1,000 for an interest-free loan from the IRS. That's the way that you need to be looking at this. So don't, don't get caught in the hoopla of this big tax benefit or this or that. You're just freeing up interest-free money from the IRS. Now, if you take that 60000 and you turn it into two down payments on two single families that create 50000 of equity each, okay, now we're talking like the equity that you're creating with that interest-free loan, that's also a benefit. So again, just make sure you have the right state of mind when you're looking at what you're getting for these things. Um, hey, Nate, can I ask a question? Yeah. On the uh, on the recapture, so if you hold the asset or, you know, if, let's say you're investing in a syndication and they hold the asset for five years, then your recapture is going to be smaller than the depreciation benefit you took, right? Because some of those items will depreciate to zero. Is that, you know, like, carpets and stuff like that, if, if they do the bonus depreciation, they cost segregate everything, aren't you going to have some of the recapture that you don't actually have to recapture? Well, I'll try to understand the question. Maybe I'll answer it by just stating this. Um, it, I wouldn't get caught up in lifespans or this or that. I would just look at every dollar of depreciation expense that you get from this thing. Every dollar of depreciation expense that you get will come back as taxable income in the year that you sell. Doesn't matter, you know, five, 10, 15 years, you know, whether you take a million dollars of depreciation over five years or you take just 10, every dollar of that comes back as taxable in the year that you sell. So there's not really a strategy for, it just doesn't go away. It's gonna come back dollar for dollar. Now I was told, um, I forget who I was talking to, um, was, was implying that if, I, I don't know how, let's say, you, depre you have a depreciation of a hundred grand is the benefit you get because you invested in a syndication and whatever it comes up to a hundred grand. Um, but some of that is, you know, when they do the cost seg, they, they put it in a bucket of 27 and a half years. Some's at the 15 years, some is at the five year. So if you own the asset for five years, you fully depreciated all of that part of it, whatever that part that is, let's say that's 10 right. grand of the hundred. So when you do the depreciation recapture, it makes sense to me. I don't know how it works, but 10 grand of that wouldn't be recaptured because that part of it had depreciated to zero. So you fully use that benefit. Is that not the case? No, no, you okay. still have to recapture that 10,000 as tax. Interesting. Okay. There's a couple more questions here while I got you. Um, one, is there is there depreciation recapture with an ATM, ATM fund that has held the full seven years? Well, it depends if, Yes, yes, there is, but we'll explain this. So if we kind of like get into the inner workings of the ATM fund, let's say the fund, let's say the fund depreciates a million dollars worth of these machines, okay? And let's say after seven years, these things cash out. I mean, do these ATMs have a salvage value at, after seven years or are they just worthless? It's very small, probably, you know, 10% maybe. Right. So um, you have to understand something where, where depreciation recapture hurts you is normally on normal residential property, right? Like property that grows in value. So if we look at it this way, let's look at an example. Let's use round numbers, $100,000 home you buy. And let's say over X amount of years, you depreciate, you know, 20,000 of it off. Okay. All right. And then let's say after X number of years, you can turn around and sell it for 150,000. So what happens in that year you sell for 150? You have a capital gain of 50,000, right? So again, that's sales price minus what you bought it for, 50,000. Then you have depreciation recapture of what I say, you wrote off 20, mm -hmm. we'll just say 20. Then you'll recapture 20, right? So those two things hit. Let's look at ATM machines. Let's say with ATM machines, you buy 200,000 or you buy 100,000 of it, okay, in year one and you write off 100,000, okay? And let's say in year two, all right, or I'm sorry, year seven, all right, these things are sold off for 10,000. What happens? Well, you have a capital loss of 90,000, right? It's 10,000 minus the 100 you bought it for, but then you have to recapture 100,000. So what's the net effect, effect of that? Well, you have a $90,000 loss and you have a $100,000 gain. So the difference to that, or I'm sorry, $100,000 recapture, the difference is 10,000 what you ended up getting for in year seven, all right? So if these things are completely worthless, 
like there's no salvage value whatsoever, it's just zero, then what would happen is, is you'd have a hundred thousand dollar loss, all right? Zero minus 100, what was originally purchased, and you would have a $100,000 recapture gain. So the net effect is zero, right? So if you think of it that way, you know, if these things are worthless after seven years, they truly did depreciate, right? right? And if something truly does depreciate, I guess there's no recapture because depreciation was real. But normally recapture where it hurts you is when we're taking depreciation on something that's actually growing in value, that's where it really feels like recapture. You're really recapturing something that you borrowed. And if you're depreciating, okay. again, actual real estate, you really are borrowing that because this stuff's going up in value. ATMs are a little different because they're actually going down and they're truly depreciating. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And we have, we have a few more. Um, one is I'm very new at passive investing. Can you use cost segregation depreciation for interest from banks or notes? And I think the answer there is no, because that's a different bucket, right? Yeah. Interest is is not um, depreciable, anyways. Right, you can't depreciate paper. You can depreciate brick and mortar, but not paper. Okay. Um, let me see. If you sell in five years, do you? Oh, this I think was I was asking. If you sell in five years, do you need to recapture five year depreciation? Also, that is not what I see being done. Only 10, 15, and twenty seven and a half years are used for recapture. Does that make sense? Do you, do you, yeah. Yeah, I think we covered that. Okay. Um, Oh, someone else already answered. Oh, good. Someone answered that one. So I think we're good for questions for now. Okay, cool. All right. So last point on here, lender considerations. I've had a lot of clients ask me, they're out of concern. Oh my gosh, what's my lender going to think if I take these huge deductions? All right. Uh, and my, my debt to income ratio is going to get all screwed up and I'm not going to be able to take out loans. Well, remember, if your lender knows what they're doing, they're going to add depreciation back. Right? So that's one of the best parts about this is if you can use cost segregation, Remember what's, what the product is, it's creating depreciation. And lenders are supposed to add depreciation back to figure out your DTI. So if you're talking to lenders about this, if your lender is freaking out, um, explain to them, hey, a lot of this is from depreciation. This isn't actual stuff that should be held against me. So make sure you're literate with this, at least to the extent where you can hold your lender accountable and let them know, you know this might be a big loss, but, but let's talk about what this is before you start denying me loans. So, you know, make sure you have that in your tool belt as well when you're working with lenders. Audit considerations and choosing a provider. This is very, very, very important. Um, audit risk. People always ask me, so if I do this, is my risk of audit going to go up? You know, my question to them is, well, what do you think is going to happen if you take a $100,000 deduction on a single transaction? I mean... Do you think that's going to increase your risk of audit or not? Especially if you save 30 grand in tax on that. The answer is yes, absolutely. This is going to increase your, your audit risk. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? Well, if you don't have anything to hide, yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, these are legal routes. If done the right way, of course, these are legal routes. And like anything, if you're legally entitled to something, you should do it. That's why the law is there. It allows us to do these things. Um, now I'm going to get into, you know, some things that people are doing with cost segs that I, that I find are borderline abusive that are setting themselves up for trouble. There's this rule of thumb approach. There's a lot of greedy accountants out there. All right. And anybody that works with me, you know, there's not one person out there that, that can accuse Nate Bush of doing what other accountants are doing here. Um, there are accountants out there that are telling clients that they'll do the cost segregation themselves. All right saying, don't hire an engineer. You don't need to do it. You know, uh, it, 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 for practical purposes, the IRS isn't really, you know, focusing that much and this and that. They'll let us use approximations and estimates and this and that. So instead of paying that engineer, why don't you just pay me and I'll do it at, at you know, a percentage of the cost. All right. Um, well, the IRS addresses that in IRS publication 5653, page 29. And if any of my clients ever want to see the language, they can just email me and I'll send it to you. But it basically says this. IRS says, we know this rule of thumb approach is going on. And they're just warning taxpayers, just remember, that's not what the case law says. The case law doesn't say that cost segregations work if you just use a, a, a good old fashioned estimate that when I buy a property, I'm just going to assume 20% of this cost is five-year property, 10% is uh, 15 and 5% is 20. 
IRS publication 5653 explicitly says, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. If you do it, we're going to challenge you on it. So be prepared. What's kind of weird about this is when Congress wrote the law about bonus depreciation, it doesn't address this. Cost segregation doesn't appear in tax law. It appears in tax courts. And remember, Congress doesn't have time to write out every scenario and address all the techniques that are used to you know, come up with these deductions and estimates and all this. Those are all things that have happened after the law has already been written. And we use case law and the IRS issues guidance and, and the IRS writes up these things called audit technique guides that instruct their agents how to audit taxpayers the right way. And that's where all this stuff is kind of meshed out. So, um, you know, again, I don't always take a, well, whatever the IRS says we need to do type approach, but it's helpful. It's helpful to know what you're going to be up against if you're ever into a fight. And the IRS says, if you do this rule of thumb approach, we're going to fight you on it. And what's abusive on this, it's not doing the rule of thumb approach that's abusive. It's when accountants say, oh, we can do this. It's just the same as, a, as an engineer. It's no problem without telling the client, actually, it could be a problem. And the IRS is going to fight you a lot harder than what they ever would a cost segregation that's done by an engineer. So be very, very cautious. If your accountant ever tells you, I can do it myself, I can come up with an estimate. You need to be very, very cautious and ask very good questions, all right? Because it explicitly says in the publication and in the tax courts and all this, engineers are supposed to be doing these, not accountants, and certainly not clients. Um, so, you know, if, you kind of, if you're in agreement and an engineer should be doing this, you know, when you're choosing a provider, you know, this is why these things have really taken off the past five years is before the past five years, the cost of doing these things have been like three to four grand. All right. That's very crop cost prohibitive. If you buy a $200,000 property and a cost seg deduction will get you a $40,000 write off and that $40,000 write off will save you 15,000 in tax. The 15,000 sounds great until somebody tells you, oh, you're going to have to pay four grand for that. And if you think of that 15,000 in the terms that I told you to, that's an interest-free loan. Is anybody in the right mind going to pay a $4,000 origination fee for a $15,000 interest-free loan? No, of course not. All right. But there's these DIY outfits that are starting to pop up a bit. Um, you know, they're charging a lot less than three to four. Um, you know, full disclosure, there's a DIY outfit that I use for myself. I pay $800 per cost set. Um, the DIY outfits are a bit different. The reason why they, they charge so less is um, they give you the same assurance as a normal cost seg, but you know you fill out you know a lot of the forms yourself. They'll review it, make sure it's fine. So it saves them the the you know time and expense of doing the on-site analysis, and you know in exchange for you helping with some of the legwork. And it really doesn't take long. It feels like an RPD, a residential property disclosure. If anybody's you know sold a property, you have to fill those out. It feels like filling one of those out. It doesn't take a lot of time. The, the results are usually instant and the cost is usually, you know, 20% of what some of these normal conventional pr pr providers do. I would advise this, if you guys ever go the DIY route, make sure you purchase additional audit insurance through these outfits. Audit insurance basically is them saying, hey, we're there for you. If you get audited, we're there for you. We'll take over the audit for you. Um, we'll work with the IRS to defend our work and our methodology and all of that. Because remember, I'm not an engineer. You are certainly not an engineer that does cost segs. Um, you need the you need the professionals handling those parts of the audit. Um, you know, I've been through cost segregation audits. I've been through cost segregation audits where you know my DIY person was was used, and it went great. It went great for a few reasons. One, I didn't do the cost seg. Number two, the client didn't do the cost seg. Number three, the engineers you know outfit did the cost seg with our help, of course, by filling out the paperwork. All right. And, you know, number four, you know, I helped handle the audit and, you know, I worked with the engineer and let the engineer handle that part of the audit. All right. And number five, the client bought audit insurance, which basically said the engineer is going to come in at no additional cost and help if needed. So it all worked out. Um, in this particular audit, my client, there was no change whatsoever, you know, passed with flying colors. And then, you know, of course, you know, no podcast or webinars complete without me plugging myself. Um, it's important that you choose an accountant. You know, accountants must not just do, they have to understand. 
There's a lot of accountants out there that are really good at copying information from point A to point B. That's the vast majority of the, of the accountants out there. They love doing their tax returns because the margins are there. There's great margins in doing tax returns. And there's not a lot of margins in doing audits or tax planning or some of this other really grinded out type work after tax season is over. I don't golf. I don't hit the links on April 16th. I'm still, I'll take a week off to spend with my six kids. But after that week, I'll come back in and I'm in the office doing tax planning for people and helping people. So again, we do more than just copy information from point A to point B. We help folks strategize and we help folks understand. Excellent. Thanks, Nate. I will, um, I'll try not to be too biased, but um, you know, Nate, Nate does my taxes and has for quite a while and does a fabulous job and does all of the, uh, the tribe tax returns for me as well. So um, you know, I think it, it makes sense to interview a couple of different tax professionals and find someone you're comfortable with. Uh, Nate's that person for me. So just wanted to state that. A um, couple more questions. If you plan to 1031 indefinitely, then you will avoid recapture. Is that correct? If indefinitely means you're going to die with the brick and mortar, yes. Excellent. Okay. And then we have a question. If you want to unmute uh, Andre or Andre, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Sorry, but do you want to um, unmute and ask your question? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, putting this on. I had a quick question for um, Nate if he's taking on new tax clients? Yes, yes, we are. Um, my email address is right there in the presentation. It's on every slide. Um, feel free just to email me. And, you know, we do an initial no-cost consult where I'll look at what you got going on. And, you know, I'll tell you the same thing I tell everybody. You know, there's no guarantee that I can do a better job of, of who you have. I'd be foolish and, and you know, ingenuine to promise that. So, you know, sometimes when I look at your materials, I'll, I'll give you a no cost validation that your guy or gal is doing a great job. Um, so, I'll, you know. Yeah, I'll definitely reach out. Yeah, because the thing I've been looking for is more of a tax strategy component. I've been um, funding like six to eight passive syndications every year. Mm -hmm. And there's always confusion of like, towards the end of the year, I want to know like, what if I've had like three exits, what how much taxes will I pay? And do I have enough depreciation to offset? Because the last two years, my tax accountant, and I've only had a professional do for two years or three, he's like, uh, you know, you know, you have like, you know, 80 or $120,000 in taxes you have to pay because of these gains. Do you know that? I'm like, okay. And then he does everything. And he's like, oh, no, actually, you don't owe any taxes because you have enough depreciation. But is there a way to calculate that? Or because I, I asked him that, he's like, well, you don't really know. He's like, you, you kind of just have to do it and then see what you owe. I don't know if you offer that. Yeah, we do. It's called tax planning. Um, you know, we just look at the losses that you have. You know, we work together. I mean, it requires work. It's not just a two minute phone call. And, you know, my experience, a lot of accountants really don't want to be on the phone very much, you know, outside of busy season. So, I mean, it, it's hard work. I mean, it's not easy doing tax planning. Um, so, you know, it requires a client and accountant to work together on those things. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, you know, have a consultation with you and, and we can walk through what you have going on and we can review the returns and, you know, we would give you, you know, an idea of what we would do if we are working on those items, as well as discuss your goals and discuss some initial strategies to, just to make sure it's a good fit for both of us. Okay. Thanks, Nate. I'll look for that email. Appreciate it. No problem. A couple more questions. Uh, someone asked, is, is recapture only 25% of the total depreciation amount or how is recapture figured out? Whatever depreciation you've taken, you know, that is its own line item of gain on the K-1. Somebody asked earlier, is depreciation expense listed as a separate line item on the K-1? Um, depreciation expense is not. It's usually baked into box one, which is ordinary income or loss. So think like ATMs or it's box two, rental real estate income or loss. That's from rental real estate. But depreciation recapture is listed on a separate line item on the K-1 because it's taxed at a different rate than true capital gain. And that rate tends to be 25%. Again, there's, there's exceptions to that rule. Tax law gets rewritten where it changes that rate periodically. But in general, most of the time, it's a 25% recapture rate. Okay. And we have a few more questions. We're about out of time, um, but I, I want to see if we can get to them. 
what happens if you don't use up all the depreciation by the time you sell? That's just additional cost basis that's deducted against capital gain. Okay. So it all, all right, works I, out. Okay. It looks like that's it for questions. I'll, I'll pause here for a minute while I, I do want to make one announcement. We'll see if there's any other questions. Um, we are changing the format of our webinars moving forward um, to try to save your email boxes. You will not get uh, a reminder a week before, a reminder three days before. You will only get two reminders of our webinars. You'll get an email on Monday that lists all of the webinars and meetings that we have for the week. And then on the day of the uh, whatever webinar, you will get one email uh, three hours before the, the webinar or meeting that will uh, give you the full details. So you'll get you'll get two notifications, but you'll get a whole lot fewer emails that we've been sending out. So hopefully that will uh, that will help everybody um, get a smile on your face when you don't get those emails. Um, I'll pause again. Here's one. Any other messages? I think all we're getting as far as questions are a uh, great job, Nate. So thank you, Nate. This has been phenomenal. If you are looking for an accountant or you want a second opinion, again, uh, Nate at bushtax.com and his phone number is here on the screen. Nate, do you have any closing words? Um, again, thanks for having me. Uh, in respect of every, everybody's time, because I'm having to say this now, um, and you know, I, I, I want to be full disclosure, we are not taking on advisory only clients. Um, you know, I have a staff of 10 people now. What that means is there's only one of me to go around and I'm the only person at the organization that does advisory work. And I just don't have the capacity to bring on clients that are using just me and not the other nine people. All right. So again, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, if anybody has, has an interest in becoming a client, you know, please do not ask for advice only because I can't accommodate that right now. Um, we, we do require anybody that wants to be new a client to use our full service accounting um, that means also, it really just means using us for tax preparation as well. So again, I, I say that out of respect for everybody's time. I, I, I don't want to have a bunch of back and forth only to find out that we can't accommodate you. But if, if you do, if you do their tax return, then you'll, you'll do all the other stuff as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. We, 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 our organization is a team effort. We, we collaborate on behalf of clients. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. We hope to have this uh, recording out tomorrow. And if you're, I guess if you're watching that in the recording, you already know that. But for the rest, if you want to watch it again, um, we will send that out tomorrow. Thank you, Nate. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Happy New Year. And we'll see you next week with uh, three different webinars. And that email will be coming out Monday. So thank you, everybody. Take care, Nate. Thank you.